Can machines really think? Even the scientists argue that one. I'm convinced that machines can and will think in our lifetime. I confidently expect that within a matter of 10 or 15 years, something will emerge from the laboratories which is not too far from the robot of science fiction fame. Can a computer be as smart as a human? Today we're sitting down with my friend and initialized portfolio founder, D. Scott Phoenix. Vicarious has come up with a new type of machine learning based on the computational principles of the human brain. AGI, artificial general intelligence, is coming. Let's go meet Scott. Scott, thanks for hanging out, man. It's great really? to see you, Gary. It's been yeah. so long time. Well, we were YC batchmates way back in the day, so I guess it's been 12 years, though. Is that right? Yeah, long time. The worst batch in YC history. <laughs> That's right. Well, we've gone on to bigger and better things, but and we survived, so something that's scary sort of happened, at least financially, was... Um, 2008, 2009. It's stunning. Wall Street has seen very, very few days like this. The mortgage crisis has now taken down two of the biggest names, the most storied names on Wall Street, one of them Lehman Brothers. Yeah, I remember um, being out in San Francisco during the financial crisis after YC, like trying to raise our round and wearing my blazer and going to these VC meetings and just like collapsing at the end of the day, being like, oh my God, no one is making any investments right now. Like the market is in free fall and being so relieved we finally closed our round. Yeah, likewise, we closed our seed round for Posturus um, the day Lehman died. Oh God, yeah. <laughs> it was like the day. It was like the money hit the <laughs> bank. And we were like, <sighs> <laughs> Yep. Well, since then, you started Vicarious. You know, walk us through what Vicarious is. Yeah. I mean, I guess the story really starts back before YC, even when I was in college. Uh, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life and made a big list and thought about how could I have the most impact for me. The things that gave me the most joy were uh, was when I was being broadly of service to other people. I thought about uh, spaces like education or health uh, or policy. And when I hit on AI as a possibility, it totally wiped out all the others because you know, the impact of it could be so big um, if this was the right time in history to work on it. So then it was a question of like, okay, am I 300 years too early? Or is now roughly the time when it could be possible to build AI that's like your brain and mine? And uh, when you do the math on how fast computers are and uh, how much we now know about the brain and the... Uh, the uh, progress we've made on algorithms and so on, you know, in this window, it's probably the right time in history to be working on building the first true artificial general intelligence. So when I think of like, why do you want an AGI? The reason why I want one is because there's all these, pr like every problem that has been solved so far in human existence and will be solved is, is, is solved using the same hardware in our heads, using the same set of uh, core capabilities, just stacked taller and taller. So like when I think about how we program, which is something that our like simian ancestors didn't have to do at all, the, the things that we use in order to, to write a computer program are the same object manipulation metaphors that get us through everyday life. Like I have a, I have a three-year-old daughter and she's, she has one of those iPad games where she's learning how to program, which constitutes of her giving little instructions to a tiny car about like, you know, turn right, go straight, turn right, go straight, and so on. Um, and so those that like following a list of steps, you know, starts way, way, way at the bottom of things uh, that we learn as very small children. And then if you can gain those skills and acquire them and then be able to build on top of them, you can get to something that can you know, solve the kinds of problems that we need to solve today. Like how do we build a vaccine or a, a therapy that binds to the, you know, the receptors on the, uh, on the, on the spike protein of, of, uh, of COVID. So these are all things that um, you can do with the general purpose AI, but then there are all these steps that you need to sort of get to, you know, in order to get there. How do you guys approach that? I think a lot of people, even in the industry, have vastly different and contradictory definitions of what it means to have general purpose AI. My view of what AI is, or AGI is, is given the same sensory experiences that a human has, from birth to you know, late childhood or young adulthood, um, you should write a program that can 
acquire the same concepts and the same capabilities and, and be able to do the same stuff. That's not a truly general AI. Like if you, if you put that AI inside of like barcode world, like it wouldn't work. Just like if you put a human baby inside of barcode world, like the baby would not learn how to read barcodes and like it wouldn't learn anything at all probably. Our concepts are built around the environment that we live in and sort of the constraints of what it's like to be an animal inside the world. And so that's the, the tack that Vicarious has taken towards building AGI is, you know, we, we start with something that's embodied inside of a robot that's subject to the constraints of the real world, like physics and um, friction and uh, unreliable sensors and change. Like the, the test data that the robot gets is very different oftentimes from what it was trained on. Just like, you know, the circumstances we run into everyday life are not identical to the ones that we experienced when we were a child. And so those for us serve as really helpful kind of like guiding constraints that encourage us to build an AGI that matches what humans can do rather than building one that's say very good at, at playing Go or, or Dota or something. I guess walk me through how your approach is really different than what a lot of people think of AI, which is sort of the latest in deep learning techniques. AI or an AGI especially, has started to be this conflation between what is the behavior that seems intelligent and what's going on inside the agent's mind. You and I are smart because when we close our eyes, inside our heads, we have an entire version of reality. We have a simulator in our heads where we can you know, imagine what it might be like to like climb you know, Mount Everest on a unicycle. And we can add details of that, like maybe the, the wheels are really slippery and um, we're listening to music as we do it. We can, we can add an infinite number of details and, and those details can then change how we imagine something might play out. So we have access in our own heads to a learned representation of the entire universe. And that's how we can solve problems on things that we can't see or touch directly, like uh, working on a, an antibody or a vaccine. And it's also how we can solve more abstract problems like programming. Now, a lot of the focus, virtually all the focus on AI research today is not on that at all. It's on taking something where you already have the simulator, like you already have the Dota game, or you already have a trillion hours of YouTube videos, or you already have chess. And then you spend a lot of money on computers running on AWS to expose it to 14,000 years of just the you know, exact simulator that you've already written or already exists, whether it's a Go game or a, you know, a Dota game or whatever it is, video. And so you've learned something that can respond in a way that seems intelligent without actually having anything going on inside its head. In, in my mind, anyway, kind of the, the old, old animal brain approach to building AI. It sounds reptilian, I guess. Yeah, it's reptilian, you know, a lot of our, and, and insectoid even, like a lot of our, our insect uh, friends. Um, I saw a, a video, uh, of a wasp who um, after combat in which it had been decapitated it went through a very elaborate like wound cleaning routine where it was like cleaning its arms and its body you know to, to make sure there wasn't any uh any any wounds that went unclean from the combat uh, while holding its own head and then it flies away while still holding its own head and so it has like all of these very complex uh, routines that are sort of hard coded. There's nothing going on literally in its head. Um, whereas you contrast that to the human and like in, in humans and, and mammals, everything happens because we have this model of the world, um, not because we're just following some rote uh, reflexes that we've learned over an evolutionary process. And today's AI is largely about creating an evolutionary process through millions of years of training data that that uh, generate a system that behaves somewhat intelligently when exposed to the same stimuli. It's like the wasp with no head. Yeah, I remember seeing a video of um, you know putting a frog in front of a, the an iPad. So I mean, there's so many videos of animals like revealing that there's nothing going on inside the animal's head. It's just like following a a script that gives it the illusion of intentionality of a mental model when in reality, it's just following a list of hard-coded commands and yeah. you know, there's, no, uh, there's no deeper intelligence going on. And there are you know, really well-meaning teams out there that are basically dumping a lot of money into exactly those deep learning models, but they're not necessarily sort of pushing forward the state of the, the, state of the art, right? The, the methods are not new, the methods are well-known, 
basically. Like I would say that the, the teams are putting a lot of money in this and it's economically useful. Like I think that you can build a uh, very complex um, kind of like heuristic systems using large data sets to solve problems that are important. Like uh, DeepMind showed a system that manages the temperatures of a data center and saves hundreds of millions of dollars doing this. And I think the applications in society for doing those kinds of systems are huge and plentiful and varied and, and you, can, you can swim forever almost building those kinds of systems. I think the problem with those kinds of systems is that they're always limited by the data that you feed them with. As a species, the most interesting things that we can do exist at the edges where there's very little data. Like if you wanted to build a, an AI system to invent fusion power, it's unclear what you'd even train it on because you're trying to discover most of the things, like most of the, the work is in doing the discovery where there's no data yet. And so it's not well suited to creating the kind of human progress that I want to see in my lifetime. To, to do that, we need something that's much more human-like than the systems other people are building. Some of the most famous projects out there um, are sort of subject to this, right? Um, like even AlphaGo, if you add another square or add another row or column, um, it actually breaks the model because there's not like a deeper meaning. It does, it and you can see this too if you like read. Um, uh, OpenAI made a lot of uh, noises from a publicity perspective about their too dangerous to release language model uh, that would sen they would synthesize um, you know paragraphs of text. GPT. And when you read them, they they were locally coherent, but sort of globally incoherent because of this very phenomenon where they don't have a model of the world. Yeah, I mean they're incredibly useful uh, and complicated matrices, but there's not a deeper meaning. What, what I would love to see is more effort being spent on systems that are more human-like in this way, that actually learn that model of the world and learn high-level concepts and can reason uh, so that we can build um, something that's closer to a human brain and less like, you know, uh, the amazing uh, Cambrian explosion of different very narrow intelligences that are all trained to synthesize new songs or to play a new video game or to do you know, image labeling or something. And I think that's uh, why we started Vicarious and, and what I'd love for more companies to be working on too. The origins of AI kind of started this way as well, didn't it? Um, first text-to-speech models, for instance, were tr trying to use neural networks, I guess, link vicarious to the sort of lineage of AI and you know how this stuff sort of started in the you know, Cambrian era of six, the 60s and 70s. So I think the debate about how to build intelligence actually goes way further back than um, the current arguments happening or even the ones that happened in the early days of artificial intelligence in the 70s and 60s. You know, you, you, you look back towards the philosophers and you see you know, thinkers like Plato or Kant who are arguing for um, a, a human mind that uses symbolic primitives or, um, you know, uh, platonic solids uh, or pure reason in order to understand the world. Uh, and then there are others that are more in the lineage of people like Skinner who believe that everything is behavior and there's, you know, the human mind is effectively blank and there's nothing that's innate. And I would argue that those two extremes or paradigms of thinking uh, from a philosophical and then later from a, a psychological or, or a psychophysics perspective, moving into an artificial intelligence perspective, that, that pendulum swing of like, is everything learned uh, or is, is everything hard coded? Is it nature? Or is it nurture? Uh, has been with us for a really long time. And I think because a lot of the recent successes commercially, have been with uh, using very large compute uh, power with very simple algorithms to, to, to create systems that are economically valuable or at least show flashy demos. Um, that's kind of swung the, the pendulum in favor of uh, viewing the mind or the artificial intelligent mind anyway, as something that is um, all on the nurture column. But I think if you take a really close look at the literature and the neuroscience and the cognitive science communities, there's so much that humans are able to do from incredibly young ages. And there's no way to bridge the gap between our current artificial intelligence systems that take 14,000 years to learn how to manipulate just one Rubik's cube and a human child, which can do it in you know two years. 
And so there's a, a very significant gap that I think needs to be bridged by bringing more innateness, more uh, nature into the way we think about how to build artificial intelligence. And that's been one of the North Stars for Vicarious is thinking, okay, for the things that need to be learned, we should learn them. But for the things that uh, are likely to be innate or we can find strong biological evidence for being innate, then we should take advantage of that and, and use um, some more structure in the models that we create. And I would also, for the people who are more like deep learning purists, uh, I would observe that a lot of what's taken for granted in modern deep learning systems, things like um, local receptive fields or convolution or um, reinforcement learning or batch normalization um, are all either biologically inspired directly or uh, after the fact you, you could look back at the biology and realize, hey, there's actually a really strong neural correlate for this. I think that provides some encouragement that we're looking in the right direction. Uh, and seeing that what's, what's gotten us to where we are now in our quest for intelligent machines is actually looking for more innate structures. So in terms of innate structures, um, we both have young children who are growing very quickly and you know, going from basically Tamagotchi mode into real human mode, which is amazing to see. Are there parallels in terms of types of learning systems that sort of layer on top of one another or you know is that a salient feature of the systems you you're focused on in building yeah i think so i think you know there's a there's a hierarchy of skills that we form and a hierarchy of representations that we form uh, as humans as we develop and um, the the learning systems that we we train at vicarious inside the robots exhibit many of um, the same kinds of properties where by having access to one set of concepts you can construct higher level concepts. And that was something that um, if not, if it wasn't published in the science robotics paper we released last year is, uh, you know, we'll be in a follow up to that paper. But I think, you know, drawing from our experience as humans and from the cognitive science and, and neuroscience communities is something that can be a really powerful accelerant for figuring out what are the right directions to point our, you know, the next iterations of our AI architectures beyond, well, let's just get a bigger computer. How do you break it down into um, smaller pieces? Or is that not possible for something of, of this sort of magnitude? You know, the classic standard SaaS view of software is ship something to, you know, a small number of users, make them very happy, and then iterate from there. And I don't even know how you apply that to something like AGI. So I think all of the big technologies, uh, or virtually all the big technologies that have come to reshape our society have been created using a really similar blueprint or recipe. Like I think about Amazon, to create an everything store where you like can order anything and it gets there the next day uh, is a crazy idea, you know, circa pre-internet or even circa early internet. And to build it, Jeff had to, you know, make a core technology and apply it to one very narrow thing, uh, which you started with books and so, you know, inventing e-commerce and uh, using a distribution center model for doing those shipments um, was enough to kind of get the flywheel spinning. And then the more you turn it, you go from books to books and CDs and the CDs and games, and you expand outward and eventually you sell everything to anyone really fast. Um, or I think about Elon, like Elon started SpaceX to build a Mars colony. And you can't build, build a Mars colony in one go. And if you want a Mars colony, what you really want is a space logistics company. Uh, and so he started with, you know, the long-term goal for that was to get large reusable rockets. And the short-term one was, well, let's build small disposable rockets as a stepping stone to get to the large reusable ones, which make the Mars colony possible. And you can kind of look at, at any of the, of the very large successful companies that have come to shape uh, an industry or an aspect of society, and they all follow the same footprint. So for... For us, uh, as a robotics and AGI company, you know, what we want is any robot, any task, no programming, just language. And um, we're gonna get there one step at a time where we start off with a small number of different robots doing a small number of different tasks. And every time we add a new task, the robots get more valuable, we get more customers, we get more money, which lets us make the robots do more tasks and so on, and we, and we fly that wheel until you know, the robots really can do anything, including solve very challenging problems like the ones that face us in society today.
Robotics is sort of the way to have a very direct economic impact very quickly. And I'd also say that like, I like businesses that while, you know, it's good to have a very long term, like in 30 years, I want to, you know, cure all disease or something kind of um, uh, ambition for society. Um, but I, I especially love businesses who can create value all along the way. And um, so you don't have to wait you know, 30 years to find out if your joke was funny. You can, you can create value for everyone. Uh, every time you have a small success, it gets you closer to that long-term goal and it also helps people uh, in the immediate term. And so that's what we're trying to do at Vicarious. There are so many problems in robotics that require basically a lot of if statements and one-off work, a lot of cal calibration. And, you know, have you been able to apply more general techniques to have, you know, a, a machine that teaches itself to learn? I think we've made a lot of great progress so far on, on, on Vicarious's mission. And, and our customers certainly appreciate it in the sense that most of the customers we talk to, they don't own any robots. Like they've never been able to own any robots, even though robots have been around for 30 years, 50 years even. Because to get a robot to do something, it just requires a lot of very brittle programming and mechanical engineering and fixtures and um, you know, hard upfront costs that then make the system inflexible. And so we're able to throw all that away and instead provide them with robotic labor as a service, the same way we can get computers as a service these days. It's much more flexible and dynamic than you know, would be possible using uh, any other system other than what Vicarious provides. We're actively serving multiple customers um, and our systems are running almost 24-7 doing you know, real work in factories in America. We can do a bunch of different tasks. So you can see at the website if you want to dig a little bit deeper, but it's, it's everything from packaging, machine tending, kitting, palletizing, depalletizing, sorting. Um, there are many different tasks we support and um, many more coming soon. And then these are classically things that would be sort of single purpose. You know, there are definitely robotics companies that have done si single things really, really well per se, but um, yeah. none that are sort exactly. of general purpose across so many different tasks. Yeah, I think for us, um, the difference between us and many of the robotics companies that exist um, that are much smaller than we are is the, the average robotics company builds one product and has to charge a lot of money for it because they just have one product. Uh, and uh, even building one robotics product is very difficult. And so you have to build a whole bunch of custom stuff to get it to work. And so you're not able to amortize the cost of your product over a very large customer base or over a large set of applications. Whereas for us, we just have one AI layer we've spent the last 10 years building. And so because uh, it's so comprehensive, we can create new applications relatively quickly and we can amortize all of the costs of doing a deployment over a customer who needs 50 or 100 or 500 robots. And so um, that makes the economics much better for us and much better for them. Now, recently, I was on an episode of Netflix's Explain series by Vox, and mm -hmm. uh, the topic was coding. And one interesting direction they took that I didn't expect, but you know, is definitely right, was they started identifying that when you talk about traditional robotics approaches, what you're talking about is rooms full of coders writing code that would do one specific purpose within a factory, for instance, like just picking this up and putting it in this other thing, right? Uh, yep. Loading and unloading is like just one vertical and you could have a team of engineers working on just that one thing. There's this coming revolution where the machines could program themselves. That sort of sounds like what you've already started working on, basically. Exactly, you know, you don't yeah. need one-off sets of uh, you know, programmers that are sort of doing these sort of infinitely deep, deep learning projects that only do that one thing. They're you know, really learning systems that l learn how to learn. And you can see some of that in the, in the science robotics paper in terms of, in, in that one, there's the, the, it really does program itself. Like you show it a, a, a pair of diagrams, you know, like in one, in one diagram, the apples and oranges are all mixed together. And then in the second diagram, the apples are on the right and the oranges are on the left. And then you show it, you know, maybe two or three examples of that and it figures out, okay, the program that you're trying to communicate to me is sort apples and oranges and on the left and on the right in this way. And then it, it literally writes the, its own code and then it executes that code on the robot. So that's, you know, that's exactly the direction that we've, we've gone with it and, and continue to go. That's really cool. What advice do you have for um, 
people who are sort of us, but when we're 18 or 22, just starting out, maybe just learning to code or reading the right things, following the right people. But what does society want from us, us builders and creators, right? What, what advice would you share to the 18 or 22 year old version of yourself based mm -hmm. on what you are now? Uh, how much time do you have? <laughs> I would emphasize how hard it is. I think that a lot of emphasis in the startup world on building short term, get it to market, flip the company, move on to the next thing kinds of businesses and, and products for markets that are already overserved. So I think about things that are primarily consumer apps or uh, in heavily saturated markets. And then there's very few people who take an interest in uh, more esoteric but important building blocks of society. So I think about businesses like SpaceX or like Flexport uh, or like Coinbase, who are now very large and successful, but to build them, you had to be kind of weird and very interested in something that most people were you know, too busy building social media apps or building um, something that was much more kind of short term or narrowly focused uh, to want to invest time in. And so I guess the advice or encouragement I would give to young people who are thinking about this as a line, of, a line of work is to reflect very hard on what is the biggest gift you feel like you can give to your fellow humans and decide with full intention to make that your life's purpose and know that it's going to be incredibly hard and painful and you'll be met with resistance but ultimately, by being able to give your largest gift to society, you're also giving it to yourself. Like you'll feel the most fulfillment by knowing that you've become who you were supposed to be. I guess that's the advice I would offer to young people who are thinking about having a career in startups or, or, or technology is technology is the ultimate lever humanity's ever found on creating a better life for everyone here. And um, you can be part of that, but I would encourage you to be part of it in a way that leverages your unique gifts and your unique, um, you know, weirdness is the wrong word, but like interests and, and set of backgrounds and, and passions. There might be something that you're very, very interested in that's really unusual. I, I remember meeting Ben Silverman, uh, who started Pinterest, and he showed me the demo, and he was just like two, two, it was him and his co-founder or something at the time, and he's like, you can collect things, and like make websites where you like have pictures of all your stuff. And I'm like, why would anyone use this? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, or even you, Gary, when you showed me posters, you know, yeah. at the first meeting of our YC class, I'm like, yeah. what are you building? And you're like, it's email for blogs. You're like, <laughs> right. email to make a blog. An email. <laughs> How did you get in? You know? Yeah. And so I think if you can tap into what you really feel in your bones is the gift that you have to give to all the other humans and then build, build, build to try and make it so. Uh, and be prepared for setbacks, but stay true to that gift that you want to give. Um, that's where I would uh, apply my my energy. I mean, I feel like even in this interview, you've been able to show sort of both of both of those things, right? Like we talked about AGI. It's probably you know the biggest thing that humanity will see in the next hundred years, or you know, or ideally, like much sooner than that. And you're trying to bring it about much sooner than that. But at the same time, you're able to basically bring it down to the level of how do we make money and how do we, <laughs> you know, how do we actually economically make a difference in uh, the lives of your customers? Like the, you know, the people who, you know, they're, they're making widgets, they're making, you know, X and there's, you know, a top line and a bottom line and the technology can actually be applied already in a way that puts dollars and cents in people's pockets and it's economically viable and that's what can really grow like you said earlier that's really powerful thanks, thanks for modeling it <laughs> it's yeah. like that's really really cool and also rare right what you've been able to do is very very rare you know as you were talking about it, it it just reminded me of how hard it is like i think you know if you go to vicarious's website you see a list of you know, all of the most famous people as our investors and all these publications and in, in you know, the highest profile possible academic venues and our incredible team and really polished videos of robots doing, uh, you know, real work. And like, it's been 10 years. It's been an incredible and, uh, you know, at times wonderful and at times heartbreaking journey to, to build the company. And, and I think anyone who's trying to do something um, that is 
their calling is their destiny. It's going to have that character to it where on the outside, like you look at what Elon has been able to do. And on the outside, you're like, wow, you know, electric cars and tunnels and spaceships. And it's just like super cool. But you hear him talk about the moments where he had to risk it all or where he wasn't, he was sleeping on the factory floor, like, and all the short sellers were squeezing the life out of the company. And it was, you know, on the verge of bankruptcy so many times. I want people who choose to walk this path to choose it with eyes open about that it's going to be hard. And there's going to be moments that you doubt that, you know, you should be doing it or that it's going to work out. And, and, um, like that's part of the choice to do it. Like I knew when I started Vicarious, like I want to build AGI. And we pitched it to virtually every investor in Sand Hill Road. And you know, the only ones who said yes were the ones who backed me in my, my, my previous company, basically, uh, with a couple of exceptions like Dustin Moskowitz. And um, I knew and very, you know, with eyes open, committed to myself, like this may not go anywhere. This may be incredibly hard and I'm comfortable spending the next decade you know, working kind of by myself on this thing that maybe no one else ends up caring about or doesn't go anywhere because it was that important to me. And I would find something that you feel that way about uh, and commit to that because in those darkest moments, that's what will keep you going. Uh, there's no, you know, there's no pot of gold or exit or, or, or uh, you know, shiny article in Forbes or something that, that makes it all worth it. The thing that makes it all worth it is is being true to yourself and being true to know that this is what I'm supposed to be doing, even if it's, you know, impossibly difficult from time to time. It's awesome words, man. That's Thanks. really helpful. I'm glad to have you as an investor. <laughs> glad to be an investor. Yeah. Awesome, man. Thanks for doing this. <laughs> My pleasure, Gary. It's so good to see you. It's great to see you, man. Bye.